The Tom Woods Show, episode 2197. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. We all know it is time for us to break up, but everybody's status quo bias is standing in the way of this obvious and humane solution. Check out my brand new ebook called National Divorce, The Peaceful Solution to Irreconcilable Differences, which you can get for free at nationaldivorce.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. I am delighted to have an opportunity to speak today with David Freiheit, known better to the internet world as Viva Fry. He is a lawyer in Canada. His commentaries are just outstanding. He's been terrific through COVID, through all the fake obsessions of the U.S. mainstream media. I had an opportunity to appear on his program alongside the great Robert Barnes, and he's just got an awful lot to say that I want my audience to hear. So, Viva, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Tom. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah, I got to know you because I was on, well, I guess I was on with you and Robert Barnes on Can you explain how your show works, that you have Robert Barnes with you from time to time? Yeah, it's a strange setup of sorts. I started off doing short videos once upon a time, started doing longer format live streams, met Barnes, and we started doing a weekly stream every Sunday, which is just he and I talking like the lost stuffs of the week. And we do every Wednesday something called The Sidebar. The name was picked by our locals community, and it's a great name, where we have a guest and we talk about something either current or something evergreen from philosophy to politics. And we've had some great guests on the sidebar Wednesday night. And Tom, yours was one of the best. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I made it into an episode of the show. I'll link to that on the show notes page. By the way, is there ever any problem with the fact that you're in Canada and so the law might be different? Or is it close enough that you can still comment intelligently? Well, it's a funny thing. Now I've actually moved to Florida, at the very least for the near long term. So I'm always specific in my analyses to specify the limits of my expertise. I'm a Quebec certified attorney. Quebec is a civil law system. Canada has both civil and common law. So I don't even have a common law degree to say I can practice in other provinces. So I always specify the limitations of my knowledge. But by and large, you know, Western legal systems have similar concepts, unless there's radical laws that differ from one state or province to the other. They differ in procedure, they differ in certain time frames, but by and large, you know, it's mostly the same concepts, but you have to know the specific rules and, and make sure that you know that you don't know them from one state to the next. I am less familiar with your legal career than I am with that of Robert Barnes, who has of course had has worked with some fairly high profile people. Can you give us the quick background, your professional background? Yeah, absolutely. I don't often talk about it because I'm somewhat neurotic, to put it mildly, and I don't want to you know, even run the risk of accidentally disclosing anything that was private knowledge. But I practiced actually for over 13 years, sworn in in 2007. I did commercial litigation, basically everything except for family, criminal, and tax. I did a lot of landlord-tenant disputes, copyright law. And you know, as far as Quebec goes, we had a few very big cases, but I, I've had a, you know, a decent 13-year career before I decided, I don't want to be doing this in another 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll ask you later what part, well, I don't know. Do you feel like telling me what part of Florida you're in? The Lower East Side, Fort Lauderdale, Boca-ish area, and it's beautiful. We were looking at the inner coast on the Gulf near Sarasota, stuck to the East Side for, uh, you know, connection family reasons. I always hear about people moving to Florida and I get my hopes up and then they're never anywhere near me. Nobody <laughs> ever settles in central Florida for some reason, but that's where I am. Well, anyway. you know, I don't mind driving. I, I love driving. I, just the other day, we drove up to Lake Okeechobee to, you know, to have a gander. So there's nowhere in the state of Florida that is too far even for a day excursion for me. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I have the occasional pretty rock and party at the Woods residence. So I'll keep you on the list. Let's Sounds just say. very good. You'll meet some interesting people. <laughs> All right, so now I guess I want to get to know you a little bit more in terms of where you came from philosophically and where you are today. Because I dare say there are very few people alive in 2022 who haven't undergone some kind of transformation, if not in the past two years, then at some other stage of their lives. So how did you start off, let's say, when you went into 
college? And where are you now in the way you think? Or have you been consistent all those years? I don't know that you can stay consistent in the face of changing circumstances. So you have to change. Changing is not a question of being inconsistent. In fact, not changing when circumstances and knowledge changes itself would be inconsistent. Like me as a human, youngest of five kids, parents are still married. They've been married for 50 plus years, uh, eight and a half year difference between oldest and youngest. Family of lawyers, four of the five kids turned out to be lawyers. My father's a lawyer. Jewish by birth, I'm not at certain points in my life will be more, not more religious, but pay more attention to the rules than others. And for the last little while, I've been on a total bender, not following any meaningful rules. But it's, I guess, in a way shaped who I am today. That's the upbringing. Politically, philosophically, the two major litmus tests that I know that I've changed over the time relate to the death penalty and abortion as concepts. And those opinions have changed in light of becoming aware of inherent problems in the system that new facts have to change your assessment of your prior held positions. But the radical revolutionary change where we've effectively all learned that we've been lied to, misled, gaslit by the pillars of what we thought were you know, the foundation of society, that started uh, you know, 2016. The Trump run for presidency, the Trump winning the presidency, seeing, you know, Democratic people or people who call themselves Democrats, liberals, becoming the most intolerant, frothing at the mouth, raging, anti-democratic, anti-free speech individuals. Either I changed or the world changed around me, but at least the interplay between me and the rest of the world changed. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was wondering about. You know, just the other day, I was listening to a talk on the early 1960s, and it hit on the assassination of Kennedy and then the official explanation for what happened. And the lecturer said, it's hard for people to realize this, to fully grasp this today. But back then, if the government said something, everybody believed it. Really, everybody believed it. I mean, you you had Democrats and Republicans, and they would snipe at each other here and there. But basically, everybody believed it. And the Kennedy assassination was one of those pillars that when this happened, it made people wonder if they'd been right to do that. They became more skeptical. We live in a world now where nobody believes anything, or at least our side of things doesn't believe anything. And then the other side, they believe pretty much everything put out by the regime, but nothing that we say. It's a very, very different world. I mean, if somebody had lived, let's say been born in the 40s and lived through this and observed what's happened to American society, I think he would... I would be of two minds. On the one hand, I would feel just absolutely in despair at what's going on. But the second part of me would say, well, wait a minute. We've gone from no skepticism toward the American government whatsoever to now there is a major, major chunk of the American population that if they said we're going to save dying puppies, they'd say, yeah, right. (laughs) Forget it, buddy. The amazing thing, and I, I was just listening to another YouTube friend who does, you know, interviews with FBI agents, talks about the JFK assassination. And last Friday, they were talking about the JFK assassination, where it's at now, the conspiracy theory versus what is now accepted as fact. And I didn't appreciate the the impact of that assassination from the conspiratorial perspective, from people being called conspiracy theorists for thinking there was something more to the story than what the government was saying, and how we've now gone from one shooter, three bullets, to actually understanding that there was a government conspiracy with multiple players that had been hidden from the American public for an extended period of time, and the people they tried to write off as nutcase conspiracy theorists, anti-government lunatics at the time, were probably closer to the truth than those who blindly accepted what the government said. And I, I like to think that I would have been able to sniff that out at the time, but I'm not so sure. But yeah, it is true that we're living in a world now You know, those who are paying attention know, as a matter of fact, to greater or lesser degrees, that we're being lied to in real time for the benefit of those who are lying to us. And the only question is whether or not people choose to believe those lies for whatever the reason, whether they're too heavily invested in the lie, whether or not it's a convenient lie to believe, or whether or not it plays in their favor politically. The shift has been monumental. And whereas, you know, what I imagine was back in the JFK assassination, a small group of people that they were calling conspiracy theorists, everyone else believed the narrative. It's probably inverted now, and it's caused some destabilization to some extent, but you have to destroy the rotten foundation in order to build it back stronger. 
when you note that it may, let's say, help somebody politically or may serve people's political ends to at least claim to believe these various things, it also helps people socially. Because imagine going to any kind of semi-elite gathering and you know, showing up and saying, well, you know, actually, I'm not so sure Hillary would have been such a great president. Like, what would happen to you? Or you say, this January 6th thing is totally overblown. I mean, it's unbelievable the things these people obsess over and the things they lose no sleep over whatsoever. Or isn't it unbelievable that the whole left liberal establishment pretty much went for the Iraq war and it led to all kinds of human suffering for no good reason? I mean, try saying any of those things. (laughs) You know, so... It's way better to just keep your mouth shut, wave whatever the hell flag of the month it is I'm supposed to wave, and just not say anything. It is, from the social perspective, yes, although it's gotten more fun these days than it once upon a time was. But no, it's the idea, the Hillary Clinton emails, like the scandals that people who don't want to believe can't believe, and they just need to be fed that narrative. It's easier for them to go on living and accepting the fact that they have not been supporting the criminals all along. But the Iraq war, I guess, in retrospect, was one of my turning points because I remember the second one. I was too young for the first one. I remember the second one. I remember the weapons of mass destruction. I remember, you know, they were saying 17 intelligence agencies confirmed that there's WMDs, MI6, whatever the French intelligence was. I forget the name now. I remember all of them saying it in tandem and I believed it. I said, well, they all say it. It has to be true. And I remember the goalposts moving in real time where it was WMDs, you know, the meaningful weapons of mass destruction, not Scud missiles. But when the meaningful weapons of mass destruction didn't turn up, oh, well, then goalposts moved. They shot Scud missiles at Israel in the first couple of weeks. Those are weapons of mass destruction that they weren't supposed to have. Therefore, all's justified. And now I look back on it and I appreciate that intelligence It's not corruption like briefcases full of cash. It's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We know what we need to say in order for the powers that be to need the justification they need to do what they want to do. So they prepare the reports. It says what they want. The truth comes out, move the goalposts. And I fell for it at the time and I won't ever fall for it again. Yeah, I hear. Well, I am a little older than you. So I do remember the first of those wars and I supported the first one because I was a college freshman and I didn't know any better. And I just felt like the world was divided into two camps. And the way I saw it, all I had done was divide the ruling class into two camps. You know, I, I still was sporting them in one way or another. But yeah, when this whole thing happened, and as you say, the goalposts were moved, my favorite part was when they were finally out of things to say. They Okay, we all have to admit now they didn't have the weapons. There wasn't any collaboration between Saddam and the 9-11 attackers. So then it was, well, you must love Saddam Hussein. I mean, he deserves to be overthrown. What do you just love Saddam Hussein? Look, I don't even love my next door neighbor. You know, the idea that I love Saddam Hussein is so ridiculous, but that's the level of discourse that you can expect if any of these people ever get questioned. I forget who, I don't think it was Madeleine Albright. It was another one of these horrible people. She recently died, of course, but one of these horrible people, they brought, oh, it must've been her. It was shortly after she died, an old video surfaced on Twitter of somebody very respectfully but firmly raising with her in a public forum, you know, look at all the types of regimes that the U.S. government has supported. You know, just be honest with us. Just say, well, in this case, yeah, we have to support a pretty rotten regime. Don't pretend that there's some great principle involved, you know, when you're going after Saddam. And he raised all these intelligent questions and she gave him a third grade level response. Well, some people want to make excuses for Saddam Hussein, but some of us believe in human rights was her the, basically the gist of her answer. That's all they've got is to treat us like we're seven. Unfortunately, a lot of us are seven. A lot of us are, but a lot of us are a lot smarter than seven-year-olds now with the democratization of information on the internet. Yes. Which is undoubtedly the last frontier for the government to regulate so they can go back to controlling the dissemination of information. I think I remember that particular clip. There was another one of Albright on 60 Minutes Asking oh. whether or not she re- whether or not she regretted it, was it Lewis Carroll? I think it was Lewis Carroll. You know who, who talked about tyranny cloaking itself in benevolence. They have to because oh, in yeah. order to, to justify a quarter of a million dead civilians based on, I'm not even going to call it erroneous intelligence. It was fabricated, yeah. known falsified intelligence at the time because they had other political motives to go in there. Oh you know, well, you know, it could have been worse. Like you know, talking about forty thousand dead 
people from COVID and, and suicides and this and that. Well, it would have been worse had we not done the inhumane things that we did in order to solidify our control over, over people. What I find amazing, it's the Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat, but it tends to rhyme. It's the same system. It's the same procedure. It's the same modus operandi over and over again from Iraq. And you can appreciate why some people with the firm grasp of history are able to predict the future a little bit better than, than others. The tyranny cloaked in benevolence thing is so important for people to grasp because we have to understand no tyrant is going to go to the microphone and say, I'm exercising power over you because I'm an evil bastard who enjoys exercising power. That will never happen. It'll always be, it's for your own good, it's for your health, it's to keep you secure from the bad guys over there. It's always for something like that. So the people who think we're exaggerating when we use the kind of language we do, they genuinely apparently are waiting for a tyrant who actually says, hey, everybody, I'm a tyrant and I'm just exercising power for no good reason. Tom, I had this fight. I mean, I think it's a bona fide troll on the interwebs. I had this fight with someone who says, Viva, you're a liar because you keep calling Trudeau a tyrant and a dictator, but he was democratically elected. And I was like, first of all, do you think they pass a decree that says this hitherto for shall now be a tyranny? I certify that I'm a tyrant and a dictator. Hitler was democratically elected and then used the system to remain in power indefinitely. The idea that there's some formal legal threshold after which someone becomes a dictator, a fascist, a tyrant is so juvenile. But when you talk about, you know, like always finding the greater good as the justification, and we look back at Hitler and we just assume he was openly evil. Everyone knew that he was evil. He was open about his evilness and people were just powerless to stop it. And uh, I read an article in Forbes, you know, likening or at the very least drawing what they call echoes between Justin Trudeau's euthanasia rampage in Canada and the Nazi regime's mercy killings of, uh, you know, leading up to the Holocaust. And I, you know, I, in a sick pit of my stomach, I realized, my goodness, when the Nazi regime was killing handicaps, gypsies, blacks, you know, the mentally ill, leading up to the Holocaust, they found a way to cloak that in benevolence for the people. It wasn't as though they were walking around saying, we're evil and you can't stop us. And it turned my stomach to come to that realization that even in the darkest chapters of history, it wasn't as though they were running around saying, I'm evil and you can't stop me. They found a way at the time, at the very least, to attempt to cloak their genocide, mass murder, most egregious acts against humanity in some form of benevolence. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. I think we've all been in a situation where things seem to be going so wrong in our lives that we get focused on the problems themselves rather than coming up with solutions to get us out of them. It can be hard to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when you're faced with a bunch of challenges. Instead, we become obsessive, we catastrophize, we think about the worst possible outcomes, and none of this does a single thing to make our lives better. It only makes things worse. Well, a therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals. And I do not hesitate at all to tell you that I have made use of therapy, and in particular, of BetterHelp. Like everyone, I've gone through some rough times over the years, and BetterHelp matched me up with the perfect specialist who heard what I was saying and helped to guide me through. It is a great way to get rid of stress, to find emotional healing, to help with anxiety and depression. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp really is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, entirely online. You just fill out a brief survey, they match you with a therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash woods today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash woods. All right, let's go back to 2016 because you said that was a kind of turning point for you. I think after 2016, there was an accumulation of things, just one after the other after the other. But was there one particular event that made you sit up and take notice that something wasn't right? The one that comes off, like right off the top of my head, Trump becoming racist. And I remember uh -huh. the fights that I was having with people. I was like, Trump has never been called a racist. You know, he, he won the Ellis Island Award or he was granted or gifted. I don't know what the term is. He was given the Ellis Island Award for brotherly love in the 80s. He has never been accused of being racist or intolerant. And then all of a sudden, all of these people 
who hitherto, you know, not hitherto, who up to then adored Trump, watched his, loved him. Second, he comes down and starts talking about border issues, becomes a political adversary. He becomes racist, fascist, throw in the is. He becomes the embodiment of evil overnight. And then you keep presenting the evidence. You just say, like, how can someone go overnight and become racist when, you know, they've spent their lives not being racist, avoiding these accusations throughout their entire life, right up until the time they decide to run against the Democrats. And you just see the mental gymnastics that people go through to try to justify to themselves. Oh, the Ellis Island Award is irrelevant. It was, he was given that uh, 20 years ago. Oh, what he said about Mexicans as he came down the escalator over the top. And they fabricate statements to themselves. They fabricate understandings. They read into things that which they need to read into it in order to justify the foregone conclusion that they've come to. And it was the arguments about Trump instantaneously turning racist the second he decided to run against the Democrats that I realized this is just a pattern that they use over and over and over again. You know, the the sexual assault allegations or sexual misconduct allegations from Clarence Thomas to Donald Trump to Brett Kavanaugh to Roy Moore. It started then, but I do remember the first thing was Trump overnight becoming racist. And I listened to what he said. And I was like, okay, I mean, maybe it's a little rough around the edges the way he said it. This is politics and you have to make the soundbite resonate. But then he just went from being a celebrity, never accused of anything like that in his life, to public enemy number one, the most racist person in America. Something's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you consider, first of all, the kind of people accusing him of things and accusing... and. Uh, I don't know who's guilty of sexual misconduct. I'm sure a lot of them are all sleazes. But the thing is, these people themselves who make the accusations, they're surrounded by sleazes. They could find abuse three inches away from them, but they choose not to. They use it as a political weapon almost exclusively. So there's that. But then the other thing, think of, again, the kinds of critics of Trump, the elite critics. They all live as far away from American diversity as they possibly can, every last one of them. Now, I'm sure that's entirely coincidental and that if I told them that, you know, I could help them move to Harlem anytime they want to, I'd be glad to help with the moving van. I'm sure they would agree because their hearts are full of love for the idea of the brotherhood of man. These people are walking contradictions. They're hypocrites. They're the hippiest crits of all. (laughs) as Ralph Cramden once said on The Honeymooners. I like that expression. Well, there's been that revelation as well, is is the, you know, I think, like I said, I'm not a religious person. I now appreciate, however, that humans need something of religious guidance, or they need something to ground them. And when they don't have that, if they don't have it through religion, they're going to find it somewhere else. And a lot of them have found it in government. And a lot of people in government have, you know, now come to regard themselves as the new gods. And when I went to Washington, this was, again, post-Trump, but it was part of my revelation. You go to Washington, you see these monuments that government has erected to itself. You see the world in which politicians live compared to the world in which ordinary people live. These career politicians who become multimillionaires, not through private enterprise, not through their own skills and talents. They become multimillionaires through service to the people, which is not how it's supposed to work. And then they have to justify. They're too renowned to live among the regular people. It's a risk. It's a danger. They can't take economy flights. They need to take first-class private jets. Because, But nonetheless, they know what's best for everybody else, despite being radically detached from it. It's a hypocrisy and it's a distancing between the people and the government that I think has gotten worse, but also gotten more apparent. And in that sense, we'll probably get better sooner than later. But it's over the top and the weaponization of the accusation process. And like, my goodness, like, forget about, I mean, I know they made a big deal about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky back in the day, but forget about the Wiener laptop. Forget about, you know, Hunter Biden. Forget about Epstein, everybody there. But let's make hay over a recording of Trump, which, you know, he shouldn't talk like that and certainly avoid problems if you don't, but is an indication of nothing more than bad words, not bad conduct compared to everyone else in the system. Yeah, it's unbelievable to me that bad words are worse than the war in Iraq. You know, these are the same people who say, if only we could have responsible Republicans like George W. Bush back. I have nothing in common with somebody who thinks that way, nothing whatsoever. Now, I want you to take your time on this one, okay? I want to hear what you consider to be, and you may have to be choosy because there are so many, the worst trends today, but also 
the best trends? The worst trends. And we're not talking TikTok trends, right? We're talking like social. <laughs> we're t- exactly. That is what we're talking. The worst trends that come off right off the bat, I call it the virtue signaling trend, or I will call it the virtue signaling trend, but it's the avatar. It's the defining yourself through an avatar in order to give yourself moral authority, moral weight, as opposed to through actual conduct and actual understanding. Slap an avatar on, slap a syringe emoji, a Ukrainian flag emoji, you get virtue points, and you don't actually have to know what you're talking about, but you can feel good, you can feel enlightened, and you can feel empowered to judge other people who don't have those emojis or who might even dare disagree with you. I think that trend, the outward superficial, and I say vapid gestures, is fundamentally destructive to society and fundamentally destructive to meaningful dialogue among humans. But if I don't want to be too black-pilled, the best trend out there, I think, is independent voice and people realizing now that they need to be more independent and more responsible in how they go about formulating their own opinions. Not enough people quite yet, but more, I think, than I've ever known in my life and more, I suspect, than have ever been in the history of humanity. That's pretty much the way I see the world, as it turns out. Now, you being from Canada, you've got a background that I don't have. The U.S. has... Well, you know what? I'm trying to make sense of this whole thing. The U.S., I think, probably, when it came to COVID, was one of the better places in the world. Now, it was no Sweden, wasn't Belarus, but it could have been worse in the U.S. Canada was much, much more severe, as you well know. But yet at the same time, we did a lot of flapping our gums, but it was the Canadian truckers who did that trucker convoy. Now, I had a guest recently try to say that that was largely American truckers. I don't know that I buy that. That's but, not, I don't believe that's true. Okay, so good, good, good. Okay, so I didn't think so either. But so in other words, there's some kind of spirit of resistance buried up there in Canada that was even more confrontational than we got in the U.S., even though overall, I would say that the U.S. has more... I don't know, independent thought than Canada does. Can you make sense of all this? You mentioned it, and I'm putting some things together that I hadn't put together yet in my head. But starting from the beginning, everyone who's listening to this show right now has to appreciate how insanely over the top it was in Canada, but especially in Quebec and Ontario. Oddly enough, the two provinces with the worst record as far as COVID goes. So go figure how the provinces with the most stringent unscientific, unconstitutional measures also had the worst results. We were under curfew for five months in 2021. Started in, I think it was January, went to like April. It might have been started in December. Curfew. We couldn't leave our houses from eight o'clock at night to five in the morning unless we had a dog to walk or we had our papers. My wife is a neuroscientist and you know was doing research. She had to have papers in case she got stopped by the cops after eight o'clock when she was going to work a world I never thought I would have the, I guess, good fortune at this point because of the experience, but never thought I'd live in. Curfew, we had vaccine passport systems in the province of Quebec. If you were not vaccinated or you didn't show your QR code, which you had on your phone, you were not let into movies, restaurants, at one point, big box retail stores. At one point, 13 years old and up, you couldn't play after school sports if you weren't fully vaccinated, show your vaccine passport to play sports. It was inhumane. And inhumane in a way that will leave not lingering anger, but will live lingering trauma and a lesson that I will not soon forget in this lifetime. Now, the trucker convoy is an interesting thing. I think we have the same, not rebellious, but the same freedom-loving spirit as America, but it doesn't materialize in the same way. So we don't have Second Amendment rights in Canada. And so we don't also have the problems, the political problems that come along with vocal proponents of Second Amendment rights, but we still have something of that freedom-loving culture and leave it to truckers, to farmers, to you know the blue-collar workers, the backbone of Canadian society and not the political elite, not the financial elite living in big cities to say enough is enough and we're going to do this. It was so successful, I think partly because we don't also in Canada have as much of an evolved system of, call it infiltration, false flags, spoliation of organic protest, that we don't have as much of an issue about weaponizing intelligence and bad actors as it has been honed to become an art in the States. So our trucker protest never turned into 
anything close to a January 6th, which itself, you know, I, I appreciate was potentially not described accurately by the media. So we didn't have that problem. So it's not like we had our trucker protests devolve into any form of, you know, legitimate violence, even if only certain pockets became violent. There was none of that. And so we avoided that problem, which I think is well developed in the United States in terms of bad actors infiltrating and spoiling legit protests. Both countries at their core have a freedom loving aspect to the people. Yeah, but it's a little bit more of the truth to Canada that we're sort of subjects. You know, it's a parliamentary system. We think we have rights that are given to us by the government, not by God. But there are still some people out there who think we have God given rights and the government cannot take them away. You know, even though I enjoy traveling so much, I'm at heart a homebody. At heart, I like what's familiar and known to me, which is why things would have to get excruciatingly bad in the US for me ever to relocate. But you have, at least for the time being, left Canada behind. Do you feel sentimental about this, melancholy in some way, or do you just look ahead to a bright future? I feel guilty having the feeling that I have because it's a feeling of anger that I have. I'm not homesick. I have, other than my parents in Canada and my brothers, it's like I don't have a home, a physical home, like my house in Canada. And I remember this was one of the things that made me the angriest. When I looked at my house, it made me angry that my enjoyment of my own home in Canada had been turned into a torturous experience by the government. Like the home that I loved, I now viewed as something of a prison. Yeah. I am a homebody as well, but a homebody in the sense of family. I can go anywhere, anytime, pretty much. You know, I'll double check uh, crime rates before I go there. But if I'm somewhere with my family, I don't have a problem being anywhere. I have a bigger problem traveling alone. But, you know, I could be anywhere. And so long as I'm with my family, I'll be at home. But Canada became a prison. It became a prison. It became a place where I no longer felt comfortable. And it became a place where I ultimately, not physically unsafe, although to some extent physically unsafe when the government can whisk you off to a quarantine facility if they so choose, it became a place where I felt like a foreigner in my own land. Like I felt like I was an actual enemy of the government. And they turned were otherwise, you know, my love for the country into a sort of a feeling of disdain. I, you know, I looked at my home, I saw a prison. I looked at a lake where I would go fishing. I no longer saw the great outdoors. I saw, you know, in some sense, that I should be fortunate that the government lets me out of my house so that I can go experience the great outdoors. I look at winter and I love winter, but I went through two winters where I couldn't go outside with my kids at night to go tobogganing. And so the decision to move, if only temporarily, and we'll see, you know, if things right themselves in the interim, it wasn't easy. It wasn't fun. It was a big pain in the neck, but there was no choice. I got three kids and Canada has become a place, at least Quebec, where it's unhealthy to raise children. You know, from the direct policies of vaccine passports, which I'm hell or high water not going to be living with. So like just the psychological aspect, my kids go into coffee shops and people are fighting because they're standing too close to each other. We're living in a country where they, you know, you look at the most peaceful protest the country has ever seen and maybe even the world. And they're called Nazis and they're called extremists and they're called bigots, misogynists. This is not a country that's healthy for young people to grow up in. And my only issue is I feel guilty to some extent that we were able to temporarily relocate and a lot of people are not able to do that. Yeah. But uh, look, I ran for office before I left. I said I was going to run for the country before I ran from the country. I did that. People voted. And we'll see if the tide, the political tide doesn't change the next election if and when that ever comes around. Wow. I am glad I asked you that question because that's such a great answer. And that point about the home you love suddenly being transformed in your mind, you know, because it's, you have been in effect imprisoned in it. It went from an object of love and comfort and warmth to something in a way detestable because of what they did. Wow, man. No, I'm sorry. I'm just no, sorry it's, it's, about it's, that. In a way, I'm glad I had the experience and we're having it still. My kids are learning. But like, I just, I, I remember thinking like, we had a terrace on our roof. And I always loved that terrace. We used to go up and make barbecues. And then the terrace during lockdown became literally our only, uh, our only escape to fresh air. And I'm sitting there thinking, we are among the most fortunate people on earth that we have. A, it was a small house, but it, you know, beautiful. A terrace, there are people stuck in apartments. Yeah. And then you realize, okay, so some people say, well, Viva, you have nothing to complain about. You got a nice house. You got a terrace. You got a house. It's like, yeah. What good is all the wealth in the world when you know what's going on with other people? First of all, 
I don't have all the wealth, but I certainly, as far as being locked in your home is concerned, just having a terrace is of immeasurable relief. But then you know of people like, and we have friends, two and a half apartments, one and a half apartments. You can't leave. You can't get in an elevator. And you realize it's just like you've turned a free country into a prison. And yeah, you turned my home into something of a something of a prison as well. So you decided on the United States, you closed your eyes and just randomly pointed at a state and it happened to be Florida? Well, no, no. There's, there's good reason, which will become known sooner than later, why Florida in particular. There's good reason and there's obvious reasons. I was just going for the obvious reasons. I didn't know there was another layer to this. Well, no, it will be known soon when certain announcements okay. are, are public sooner than later. But no, there's, there's a specific reason for Florida. But also, you know, the, the funny thing is, so when you start exploring where to go, everyone's like Texas, Tennessee, New Hampshire, Florida. There's a handful of states that everyone says are the freedom states. Florida, it's, look, there's also some family connections out here. But it, culturally speaking, there's a lot of French Canadians. There's a lot of Quebecers. There's a lot of Canadians down in Florida. It's a three-hour flight from Montreal. And in a way, culturally, it's more easy to adapt to Florida than, I don't know, we've been to Texas now. It would have been easier than going to Texas. Haven't been to Tennessee yet. And if I'm moving, I'm not going to New Hampshire. I'll try a few years in a place that has no winter. I've done 43 years of winter now. I think I'm going to try <laughs> a place where I can fish without a jacket 24, uh, 24 uh, 12 months a year. Well, how do people follow you? Okay, so on, on YouTube and Rumble is Viva Fry. On this platform called Locals, where Robert Barnes and I have some amazing exclusive content. It's vivabarneslaw.locals.com. The angry, I say the angry, the more succinct, edgier side of Viva is on Twitter, which is the Viva Fry. And that's it. If you Google my name, you'll find a bunch of stories, some that predate COVID, when life was simple and we thought, uh, you know, there was nothing more to life than catching a bass with a drone. Ah, those days. All right, so Viva Fry, F-R-E-I. Everybody go check him out. I'll have a bunch of links up for your convenience at tomwoods.com slash 2197. Thank you very much, Viva, for your time. Obviously, we could go on for quite a while, but I thought this is a great opportunity to introduce you to the audience, and then I got to have you on periodically about particular topics in the news. Thousand percent, anytime. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, a couple things you need to know. Tomorrow's episode will not appear on YouTube because YouTube does not allow adults to have conversations. So I cannot run tomorrow's episode on YouTube. I'm not even sure if they allow me to tell you about alternative places you can hear the Tom Woods show, but I'm pretty sure you probably know by now. And of course, all the episodes are available at tomspodcast.com. But tomorrow's episode, again, it's an important topic that we ought to be able to talk about freely, but I can't release it on YouTube because they don't allow us to speak freely. So make an effort to listen in to episode 2198. Make the effort. It is worth it. Secondly, I want you to know, now, let me tell you something. This is not for the faint of heart, what I'm about to tell you, okay? This is not for the faint of heart. But I want you to know about a band where at least one of them's a fan of the Tom Woods show. And I pretty much like any music where one of the band members is a fan of the Tom Woods show. And their band is called Guillotine AD. So you can find out about them at guillotinead.com. They are like a blend of various kinds of what we would legitimately call extreme metal, which, by the way, Old Woods here goes for that from time to time. If you look at the list of bands I've seen, it would surprise you. They have a brand new album out just this summer called Born to Fall. They've got all the information on their website, guillotinead.com. Now, those of you who will go for what they're putting out and what they do, they're extremely good at. You'll know who you are. For the rest of you who have been listening today to the well-tempered clavier, this may not be for you. Anyway, check them out, guillotinead.com. I'll also link to them on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2197. Remember, you can get publicity like this. If you're thinking of starting a website, before you go ahead and do it, check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. You can find out about all the goodies I provide you to help get you that little extra bump when you're starting out. So tomwoods.com slash publicity is where to find out how I can help you, but you got to read about that before you start your site. So there you go, everybody. Don't expect this one on YouTube tomorrow. So go to your regular podcatchers or to tomspodcast.com for tomorrow's episode, and I'll talk to you then. 
Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.